we'll hit the record button. <laughs> Gonna hit that button too, so that we can um, put this on our YouTube channel as well as on Facebook. So I'm going to fill a little bit of time to let Facebook just notify everybody that we're here. Um, <laughs> So there seems to be that connectivity thing that happens. And I'm going to actually turn on the transcript here to, um, to see that that helps us a little bit too. So there, there'll be a transcript at the bottom as well. So um, anyhow, hi, Lori. Hi, Susan. Hi, Julie. Thank How you for you? having us. Oh, I'm so happy that you all are here. So us we too. were so happy. We were having a great conversation in the green room about geography <laughs> and about where everybody is located. And so um, for those of you that are joining us, maybe from outside of the San Diego area, let me tell you a little bit about where Warwick's is. Because when we first started doing these, I wasn't telling people where Warwick's is located. And we'd get in the chat and they'd be like, where are you? <laughs> and what are you? <laughs> it's like, and hopefully now everybody knows who we are. But anyways, so we're, <laughs> so we're located in the La Jolla area of San Diego, California. So we're our... If you're in New York or wherever you're at there, we're at opposite, and we are at the bottom corner of the country, the opposite <laughs> the opposite end over here. Um, but my little sign says since 1896. So those of you that do come to a lot of our events, you're gonna get tired of hearing this, but Lori and Susan might not know this, so I'll tell it to them. Um, we're celebrating our 125th anniversary this year. Amazing, right? Amazing. Um, so we are a fourth generation. We're not the oldest bookstore in the country, but we're the oldest continuously family owned. Wow. So yeah, Nancy Warwick's great grandfather started it in 1896 in Minnesota, moved to La Jolla in the thirties. And we've been in the building that we're at since the fifties. So yeah. we are quite an institution and legacy here in San Diego. So, um, and one of the things that I, I'm the director of events there. And one of the things I've always loved to do is connecting authors and readers. So even in the virtual world, I still love doing this. So mm -hmm. we're bringing you as many authors as we can. We are gonna start up our live programming probably starting in the fall, um, but that, you know, September, October timeframe, but I still see us doing and continuing to do virtual events because I just think we can reach and bring so many, you know, why not? So why not do it? <laughs> so um, for tonight's event or today's, wherever you're watching us from, um, the um, Lori and Susan are going to chat for about 30, 35 minutes. And then I will be in the background monitoring Facebook. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put those questions into Facebook. And then I'll pop back on the screen at about that 35 minute mark ish, you know, no hard rules there. And uh, we'll bring in any questions that we have um, from the Facebook audience. I'm also going to put in there the links to buy both Lori and Susan's books. So easy to click on those. We can ship them to you. But if you're in the San Diego area, no better thing than coming into Warwick's and shopping for books. <laughs> so please do that too. So with that, I'm going to um, going to start and do my my job, which is doing the introductions, and then I'm going to go away for a little bit. So Lori Frankel is the New York Times bestselling award-winning author of The Atlas of Love. Goodbye for Now, and Reese's Book Club's Hello Sunshine book pick, This Is How It Always Is. Lori lives in Seattle with her husband, daughter, and Border Collie, and I love this. She makes good soup. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. And I'm thinking, Seattle, rainy, you probably get a lot of practice I, making yes, that soup. Yes, that's right. <laughs> a lot of soup. It's true. I put that in there. <laughs> exactly. So she's here today to talk about her latest book, 123, which you see back there behind her corner there. Hey, there you go, Susan. And joining her today is Susan Strait. Susan is the author of the memoir In the Country of Women, based on women's stories told for five generations to Susan and her daughters, eight novels and two books for children. Her short stories and essays have been published in numerous publications, The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, McSweeney's, and The Guardian, to name a few. She's been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Lannan Prize for Fiction, a California Gold Medal for Fiction, and the Kirsch Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Los Angeles Times Book Prizes. Ladies, have a great conversation. I'll see you in a little bit. Awesome. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. I am so excited to talk about this book. I really am. I do have to show it off because I do love the cover too. And we're going to talk about the cover. But Lori, I, I can't say enough how this book made me stay up for three or four nights. Um, and that's always, to me, I wanted to start by saying, I don't know what, what the greatest compliment 
that you think a writer can give another writer. <laughs> but for me, the greatest compliment a writer can give another writer is, I stayed up really, really late to finish your book. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's up there, I think, yes. So thank you. I, Good. Thank well, you. I really loved, I really loved it. And, and I, I found myself fascinated. You and I talk about a lot about geography. We've talked about family. We've talked about everything. But what I really loved about this was that after This Is How It Always Is, which had this intense look, a deep look inside a family, I couldn't wait to see what you would do next. Yeah. And to me, one, two, three is this stunning combination of that same intimate, deep examination of this family. It's these three sisters, they are triplets. And uh, Mab, Monday, Maribel, yeah. but it's also very universal in the, the in that this deep focus on the family allows you to pull back as well and focus on a whole community that suffered. Um, and so I would like to start there. Like, how did you decide to have the three sisters be the the focal point? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, and it's such a good question, and it's such a these questions of like, how did you come up with are so important. And then you have to go back and remember <laughs> and, and like trace back the origin of that. Um, which this is how it always is. I was really wed to having as many kids as possible. And I like to have lots of characters. I tend to overpopulate novels, I think, um, because I want to explore all different points of view. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to pull off five. First of all, I couldn't really sell quintuplets, I don't think. Um, that would really have to be explained <laughs> really narratively. Um, but also, I wanted them each to be able to talk. So it's easy enough to do five siblings if, if some of them are, are relatively minor characters. Whereas in this case, I knew they were all going to narrate, and I knew they were going to do it in turns, and I knew that they all were therefore going to have to sound really, really different from one another. And so three was, was, was where I maxed out, I think, on that. But I wanted to look at how something that impacts everyone could impact three people who have so much in common just by virtue of the fact that like genetics they live together they have the same mother they um ha they have the same town they have the same memories like they've grown up in the same place and yet they are wildly different from one another and i feel like that's always interesting like that's the stuff of novels um yeah. is how how from that same kind of raw material you can go in three wildly different directions and come up with three people who not only are really different from one another but you can tell because they sound really different from one another and that's i think that's one of the most genius parts of the book is that each of the the triplets has a distinct voice and that they you know we keep hearing like oh it's hard to have you know unrelatable characters these characters are so fascinating because they literally care the most about each other but now they're teenagers and so okay. there's there are love interests there are other things but mab has her own distinctive voice yeah. and monday has her own distinctive voice she's on the spectrum she um very much is about books she is obsessed with books she's a, only the color yellow right. and mab is kind of the emissary to the outside world because she's in high school and then Mirabelle speaks as someone who cannot speak for herself. She speaks through, you know, mechanical um, devices. So all of this is to say that the town of Bourne, your fictional town, um, had a, a, a serious disaster and the water was poisoned and it affected everyone in the town. So it's got echoes of Flint and other places, but it also becomes this really evocative way to explore what does it mean for an entire community when your whole community is based on this thing and that's what i loved so much about it Lori, is that like i live in riverside california it was citrus groves kaiser steel you know boeing aircraft when my dad met my mom he was on strike from boeing aircraft and living in his car and he went into the bank for a 50 dollar loan my mom should have never gone out with him <laughs> <laughs> he did. She gave him a $50 loan and then she went out with him. But I just wow. keep thinking of how this novel really talks about work, which is something lots of American novels don't talk about anymore. So how did you get the idea to have this 
this um, poisoned water disaster and to have it be a chemical plant. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I read a newspaper article uh, in the New York Times Magazine in January 2016 um, by Nathaniel Rich, who who wrote an, who wrote this this piece uh, the, that in fact became the first chapter of a book he wrote called um, Second Nature that came out just a few weeks right. ago, maybe maybe like a month and a half ago, um, which is a remarkable essay collection. Um, and, and this piece um, is, is the first chapter of it. And, and I read it um, at the time. It is about a town, small town in West Virginia downstream from a chemical plant that had been knowingly and catastrophically polluting their water. Uh, and the lawyer who took on the class action suit on their behalf and then proceeded to sue for 20 years and counting when I when I read this thing. And in fact, it's, it's still going on. And I read that and thought it was horrifying and remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, the tenacity to, to wage a lawsuit for 20 years um, seemed really astonishing to me. And the scale and magnitude of the wrong done here and, and done knowingly um, didn't, would not leave my brain. Right. And, and, so, and so it went in there and it got stuck and I, and I started thinking about it. And, and then what happened was that as I continued to read a newspaper every day, once I was thinking about it, once I was looking for it, it turned out that what was remarkable indeed was the, the length of this lawsuit. But unfortunately, the inciting incident is something that you read about really all the time. Um, the, the towns in this country and in, and in the world um, that are downstream from someone who's, who's polluting their water and their air and their soil, uh, unfortunately, is, is pretty much all of them. And, um, and the places like this um, that are very isolated and have very few prospects um, and, um, and suffer greatly are in fact chosen because they are they are good places to to pollute without consequence, and um, and that struck me as heartbreaking and also really really important. Well, the I I when I started reading this, I was moved so much because I live in a place that right now has some of the highest pollutants in the nation because we're a huge Amazon uh, fulfillment center, yeah. and. I never have talked about this in any way, shape or form, but when I was in college and I was a journalism major and I was 18, I wrote a big piece about the Stringfellow acid pits. Mm -hmm. So the Stringfellow acid pits was like a, one of like Love Canal, this, this yeah. super fun site. Yeah. And my mom, who was an immigrant um, and abandoned with me when I was three and she was pregnant, we lived down from the Stringfellow acid pits and the water came through a ditch and all the kids in my neighborhood, we played in the water because it was rainbow colored and the bubbles were like purple and yellow and orange. And so we never, ever thought about that. And we were very poor. And now, I mean, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm, you know, a best-selling writer who travels the world. I never, ever see how someone fictionalizes it in such a beautiful way. And so if you don't mind, I'd love to read this little <laughs> passage about baking because uh, oh, that's yeah. one thing is you can say what you just said is I want to write about this thing, but to write about it with this kind of beautiful evocative imagery really means something. So the 20 year lawsuit, the character in this book mm -hmm. is the mother of yeah. the three uh, girls. And she has had these triplets who've been damaged by this poisoned water and I love her. She has been suing for 20 years. Yeah. Um, she bakes, yeah. but that's not why she bakes. You might think she bakes because it's something she can control. She couldn't protect her husband or her friends, her neighbors or her town or her daughters, but through precise measuring and careful assembly and attention to detail, she can make muffins that teeter at the serrated edge between sugar and butter, pillowed perfect sweetness you taste at the sides of your tongue like an afterthought, like you imagined it, but imagined it vividly. If you're careful, and she is, muffins are entirely in your control. But that's not why she bakes either. Nora bakes because baking doesn't involve water. 
I just, I can't say how you, you told me you didn't want to read and I was like, please <laughs> let me read that passage. Because the serrated edge, you know, and the pillowy softness, A, you're just such a stunning writer when it comes to vivid imagery and the perfect choice of language. But B, that is like a master class in how to get a reader to feel something like a knife in the heart is that we're women and we bake, we, you know, women in pandemic stress bake, but women like Nora bake and then you devastate the reader. She bakes because it's eggs, butter, sugar, flour. There is no water. And for this novel, people still have poisoned water. And it's this huge deal that they don't want to eat meat because cows are drinking the poisoned water. Right. And so baking is this huge thing. And girl, just <laughs> you're just a genius. So just, that's, awesome. <laughs> that's not a question. I mean, I know it's not a question, but I'm seeing like, as you, as you think about how to talk about your writing, can you say something to people? Like, how do you imagine something so deeply as to imagine that kitchen, Lori? <laughs> That's really, you are very kind and I appreciate that very much. Um, you don't have to ask questions. If you just want to get on and tell me I'm a genius, that's, that works for me too. I'm good at that. <laughs> yes, clearly. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that you hear um, when you, when you start tuning into this, when you read the newspapers, um, are these like, oh, they're still, in fact, like Flint is a good example. They're still using bottled water. And you just think, oh, okay, it's bottled water. I, I know what bottled water is. I, I know how to acquire it. I've used it myself. I, I know what bottled water is. But when I stop and think about if, if every time I turned on my tap, instead I were using bottled water, that is an astonishing amount yes. of bottled water. Um, and and it takes really, I every think. Every cup of tea, every, every yes. cup of coffee, every yes. wash of your hands. Yes, right, exactly. Um, and, if, and, and if you were genuinely, if you had cause to believe that, that your water was doing you real harm, that is what you would have to do. So in fact, two things occurred to me. One was, that's a lot of bottled water and a lot of commitment to it. And the other, which happens either right before or right after that passage you read, is the compromises that people would make. That you would say like, okay, well, I'll cook with it, but I will not, um, you know, I will use bottled water to cook with, but I'm gonna use, I'm gonna flush my toilet. Um, or like, okay, I can flush the toilet, but what about bathing? Okay, well, maybe showering, but what about if you were taking a bath? Okay, well, maybe I would use it for like coffee because it's heated and and in my head, I think, oh, well, that probably makes it safe, but not to drink. And all of these negotiations that you would have to do, which is how she lands on, on baking, which on the one hand, of course, involves, you know, all sorts of water, like, you know, in there's a lot of water that happens before flour occurs. But, but that's different. That feels different to you as, as a user, as a, as a baker, than pouring it into soup or pouring it into tea. Um, and I think that these are the compromises that you have to negotiate with yourself. Um, and so that's, that's how I, that's how I land on that. <laughs> well, I love it. And I love, I love to me, the fact that again, your, your prose was so lovely. And then there was another thing I wanted to bring up, which is, as you said, and I remember, because I too like to populate like my novels are populated with large cast of characters. And that's because we're both writing about community. When okay. you did This Is How It Always Is, it was all about a, not just a large family, but the entire community that supported this family. And um, so with this novel, I love the dialogue um, and I love the secondary characters. So yeah. I do love saying this, you know, I was lucky enough to study with James Baldwin and he taught me about secondary characters. And that's a major theme for my teaching and my own writing, but it's also a major theme for my life. I mean, I'm surrounded by great storytellers and I'm sure you are too. And we yeah. as writers tend to be the quiet ones who are listening. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to read this little passage of dialogue. And this is when Mab is the one who goes to school and girl, this is no ordinary high school. All of the kids have been damaged. And this, this ingenious creation that you did, of an American high school where there can't be things like SAT tests or ACT tests because half the school has been poisoned and is damaged in some way. This was just brilliant to give readers, again, a shaft to the heart to think about everything that we think we hold dear is at risk here. Yeah. 
Um, there are two kids called the Kyles, but I love this. I just, Belsim is the chemical company. And it says, well, it isn't his fault. He's our age. He is, of course, he's enrolled in high school. This is the son of the Belsim chemical um, plant um, president. Who cares if he's our age? Because what happened with Belsim happened before any of us were even alive. I love this. That's why you're so vacuous, Petra puts in, from where she's doing multiplication tables with Nellie in the corner. But the Kyles aren't studying for the SAT, so they don't know what vacuous, vacuous means, which, come to think of it, is probably for the best. <laughs> and I love this line. Huh? They say, if your dad says something stupid, is it your fault? Yeah, says one. <laughs> Usually, says the other one. I resort to platitudes. Violence is never the answer. <laughs> I think this is such a beautiful piece of dialogue because you you're so good at listening to people and in your previous novel and in this one you have this great facility for how teenagers talk so yeah. <laughs> i am going to ask you a question okay <laughs> don't you think that listening is our greatest skill as writers in some ways yeah i do i do think that and um and sometimes it's to other people and sometimes it's to people you've made up, which also feels like listening eventually. <laughs> it's kind of, I think, at least for me, it's how I know the book is working, is that eventually the characters start talking with, in a way that feels like it has nothing to do with me. And all I have to do is listen and transcribe. And, um, and, that's, and so that's what, it, that's what feels like happens, that 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 act of listening to other people and eavesdropping on conversations when you go out for coffee, when you used to go out for coffee um, and you used <laughs> to encounter other people in the world who were not actually already in your house. Um, it feels like that with characters is that you start to be able to, to just kind of set them off and then they go and, and all you have to do is listen. Um, I was really keen when I on the community in this book. Um, it was it was also part of what I set out to do um, because they have been truly and colossally wronged, and we who do not live there sh should all be grateful for this. But on the other hand, um, I think that this town would be a really wonderful place to live in other ways. They have real community. They have gone to extraordinary lengths to support one another through very hard times. And not because they're all on the same side, because they are not, and not because they always agree on everything, because they do not, but because their support of one another is, is not just paramount, but it goes without saying. And therefore, um, they have done remarkable things with, with universal design and with making this town accessible and inclusive for everyone in a way that we should all also be striving for. And so they, they, the community itself kind of functions on both ends of that, of that particular spectrum, I think. Yeah, I, I, I think really what was so striking is that as Americans, we love to talk about home and what home means. Right. And yet home has turned into this you know, place that is only for our families. And I don't live in a place like that. I live in like one of the hardest hit places for COVID in America. And you know, my neighbors all work in warehouses. Actually, my next door neighbor, Mario, was the first hundred of um, this giant county to get um, to wow. get COVID. And he was he is 40 and has four kids. And he was in intensive care for 10 days. And um, his wife, Nancy, and I, you know, we took care of each other like during this time. But what's funny is my notions of home are exactly what I loved about this. This is a place, I, if I'm telling this to readers, I have this idea that think about the Gilmore Girls, like think about the way Stars <laughs> Hollow operates. Right. Well, you're right, like everybody has their deal with each other, but everyone is down for Stars Hollow. That's yeah. exactly how you've created this really <laughs> fascinating community of born. And everybody worked at Balsam Chemicals, you know, or they worked in something that was around it. So even if you worked at the diner, you know, that supported them. The funny thing is when I was writing my memoir and I was talking to my mom, who, you know, was not a citizen until I was three, she was first, she was 16 years old and worked in Oshawa, Ontario, Canada, just across the river from the Ford auto plant in Detroit. Oh, yeah. And she worked at night at some diner, she worked graveyard shift and all the night shift from the Ford auto plant in Oshawa she served all these men their dinner. 
Right. And that really meant something when she described to me, there were four waitresses. One was Czechoslovakian. My mom was from Switzerland, like these men working so hard. And so I kept thinking of that while I was reading your novel. And I thought this novel is really about the river too. Like it's about this notion that the river plays a really big part in your plot, Lori, the river in the kind of town like this, it could be in Michigan. Like we were saying, it could be in Ohio. It could be in, in Portland. It could be in Seattle. It could be in Maine or Massachusetts. It could be in West Virginia. Yeah. It could be in Louisiana, but yeah. the river is what this Belsum chemicals needed. So this landscape you've created is quite fascinating that you've made a universal landscape of community and home. And can you talk a little about the, the big part the river plays in the plot? Yeah, yeah. And and the whole notion of geography, really, that you're talking about was very important to me going in. I, I really did not want to uh, nail this book to any particular community or any particular disaster or any particular company, importantly. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted it to be wide because, indeed, this is happening all over the place. And though the particulars vary enormously, the that general sense of um, of living downstream from something that is that is harming your water and your soil and your air is happening everywhere and quite a bit more um, frequently and ubiquitously than than I think we imagine. So it was important to me that we not be able to like read this and write that off as something that was happening elsewhere. I wanted it to be happening everywhere. So um, I went to lengths to make sure that you cannot locate this place. Like in late edits, I went and took out all of the directional the, the directional things um you know she said something at some point about like going up to new york and i, I took it out because maybe maybe you were going over to new york maybe you're going down to new york you don't know um and i and i and that sort of thing um to to try to try to make the seasons um as as kind of general as as possible so that this could be happening every anywhere and indeed everyone has a river and not quite everyone many many places though have rivers and 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 that notion of um, of water and water being something that you cannot count on and you cannot trust is something that we are talking about more and more, and I think need to be talking about more and more. Um, the, the novelists like water because it symbolizes all sorts of, of things usefully um, and it and it flows and you can be reborn and you can be baptized and like all of the things and that's. That's great, like metaphorically um, and symbolically, but but actually, the, the water you need water. You need rather a lot of it. Um, it is it is a non negotiable thing. And when it becomes something that is suspect, when it becomes something that is harming you, instead of hel helping you, when it becomes um, something that you have to learn how to do with out and work around for any number of reasons because it is polluted because it is dirty or because it is non-existent because you were living somewhere with a drought and your river has has dried up um or, you know all of all of the many reasons um because it has been dammed for instance there's that that then you are suddenly living without something that is that you can't that you cannot live without um and so this is this is this is what we're talking about more and more it's hard for me to think of current policy initiatives that don't somehow or another get traced back to water. So, yeah. so in some ways I, I feel like, like I could not, I could not put that in the center of the book. It's, it is the center of all of, of all of the things at the moment, I think. Well, I know that, that um, today it's a hundred, it's 107 yeah. degrees here and that's oh. normal. That's normal, but it's a little early. But, yep. but during this last um, few weeks after I, when I would be reading your book, I would take my dog out for, um, for her walk at night. And I've been writing for years about the Santa Ana River, which is at the end of my block. Um, I live in a house that's used to be an Orange Grove farmhouse, but I mean, it's a really busy block. It's a four lane avenue outside it. My house is 110 years old. And um, crowded with books, as you can see. I can see, but yes. I walk down the dead end of my street, and then there's this little arroyo, which is what we have that leads to a river. And um, my dog and I, and all my grown kids who've been here, every night we walk by the Santa Ana River. And ours is 
the only longest wild river in Southern California. It's uh -huh. useless. It's never been navigable because it's so wild. Either it's small or it's flooding. It's the Santa Ana River. And yeah. so I thought every night when I was reading your book about what America means, what geography means, what yeah. water means. And it was really something to be from a place like where I am and to think about what the river provided. Because yeah. one night I was walking by the river um, and this woman came walking by with her grandkids and she had like a Tupperware and a little knife. And she was from Rubido, which is where I was born, right across from the river. And that community was established in like the early, the, the late 1700s. Right. And she's indigenous, she's Kauia. And she said, I'm looking for this plant that grows by the river that my grandma said is good for diabetes. And I thought, oh my God, like A, I'm so lucky that our river is untouched, yeah. but B, our river is full of sewage, you know? I mean, that's how, Right. so I thought about all the waterways, but I really also thought, about Mab being the sort of out in the world and what she sees with the river. Monday is obsessed with books and the library that she's created. She has taken the library into her house. And Mirabelle is obsessed with the stories of the world. And yet all three girls come together around the river and the dam to sort of ingeniously make your plot work and I loved Nora. I loved the fact that, and I don't want to give anything away. That's why I'm being okay. careful. Yeah, I loved you. the fact that what your novel was really about was still home, community, family, but the resilience and strength of, of these women, these three girls and their mom. Yeah. So for you to write such a tender and touching book about something so big, it's a testament really to memory, don't you think? You want people to remember this place, this kind of place that gets damaged. Yeah, yeah, and and that issue of memory was something that ran through this thing for me and that I discovered as I went along, whereas some of these things were ideas I went in with, memory wasn't necessarily one of them, and I mm -hmm. realized along the way that if such a significant portion of the population dies, then, then they take a lot of, of generational memory that would otherwise have been passed on with them. So that in fact, one of the ways that tremendous wrongs like this can happen is that the people who could object and the people who could warn their children to be vigilant lest this happen again are, are gone. gone. And and what happens when that ha when that happens? The the other thing that that happens in the course of the book is that um is that their good memories become inaccessible to them because they have been superseded in some ways by all of these other things that happen and so for instance you this i mean it's like what you're talking about about this river that's in your community and you have these wonderful memories of playing in it as a child or of gathering Bring medicine from it or of sitting next to it and looking at it nicely or you're fishing or whatever it is that you're using it for but then you're not remembering those things anymore because instead yeah. it's been instead you have fear instead you have anger and so that's another way that memories get lost and fail to get handed down um and and so all of that seems really true to me for these for these folks in a way that i didn't know until i met them really it's really, I, I, I know we have time just for one last little thing. And I have three daughters, as you know, because we've I, talked about, about, I mean, those are my three girls behind me. There is this bond between my girls that even though two of them are married, you know, like you cannot supersede the bond of sisterhood. Right. And it's very funny for my sons-in-law to understand that and to know it. And they're really great men because they're, they're, they're good with that. So the, the last thing I wanted to say to you is that I've rarely met somebody who can write so well about siblings as you do in your last book and in this one, this very, like Mirabelle has to do something plot wise and Monday has to give something up and Mab has to be careful, but their bond is unbreakable. And that's probably the thing I took away the most that I thought about as well, besides the river is yeah. that you created these three sisters in such an indelible way. 
it's 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 an unbreakable bond even though they're very different and i loved that about your book i really yeah. did oh thank you thank you i'm so glad yeah they are they're really different from one another they navigate the world very differently from one another and that makes them really different people and then of course just like narratively they had to be really different because they're yeah. each telling these different parts of the story that all have to come together eventually because otherwise like you wouldn't keep turning pages <laughs> um so so um so that's you know that's that's part of it um and i and i i'm always really interested in how people who who don't have things in common, who are very, very different, um, who don't necessarily um, even get along all the time, nonetheless, uh, are gonna are gonna come together to do a thing. Right. Um, it's you know sort of the beauty of of novels is everybody has to come together. They are trapped. I, they can't I loved it. I loved it. Excellent. Thank you. So um, it's either feast or famine on the questions that come in from Facebook. So if you're out there watching right now and you have any questions, um, please go ahead and put those in the comments. Um, Susan, um, a, a viewer ended up having to leave, but she said this is so interesting and she can't wait to come back and watch what she had to because she had to step away what she missed. It'll also be on our YouTube channel. But I have a couple questions for you, Lori, just real quick. And I um, apologize if you talked about it at the beginning because I was doing some technical stuff in the background. But um, the names of the characters, how did you decide on that, on those names? Yeah, so they are triplets and their mother who is alone by, by this point when they're still in utero, um, when she's still pregnant, th thinks she's gonna need like a device to be able to keep them straight, to be able to tell them apart. Um, and I thought that you probably as a reader were gonna need a device too, to be able to keep them. <laughs> them apart. Um, it is a peeve of mine as a reader when I cannot tell characters apart, um, when I can't remember their names. And it's rarely for the reason that you would think. Like, it's not like the names rhyme or necessarily sound alike. It's just that they go into the same part of my brain. So so in the on the first page of this book, really, I'm, I'm going to give you a device. The, the first one who comes out is gets one syllable and she is mad. And their mother decides the second one um, is going to have two syllables, so she is Monday, uh, and the third one to to come um, it needs therefore three syllables, and so she's Mirabelle, which Mab says is the only normal name of the bunch. Well, um, that's that's the interesting part, is because yeah. the first two are not. So how did you come up with deciding that? You know, I spent a lot of time with. I spend a lot of time at the beginning when I really don't know nearly anything about the story or where it's going, and certainly I haven't got to know the characters yet picking names. I think names really, really matter. And they buy so much. So um, Mab is 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 from Shakespeare, it's from Romeo and Juliet. And so that let me bring all of that in and 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 braid that into mm. it. Um, Monday is because the because her, her mom has been in labor so long that it's become the next it's become the next day. So it is it is now Monday already. And so she lands on that. Um, and so it's just a question of helping you remember right. um, stroke names that I think are going to be fun and interesting and, right. and and have like a story, something you can hang on to and talk about a little bit. I'm so Hillary, so Hillary Mantel's book with all the Thomases must have driven you insane. Well, I <laughs> love those books. I do. So much. I adore them. But indeed, like she had a problem, which is, you know, she, everyone is either named Thomas or Henry. I, like, right. There's nothing she can do about that. Right. So she and what she did was she doubled down on it. Um, yeah. she, in fact, she for she sure did. She did, and it is, it is, it definitely takes you like a hundred of the two thousand pages to get your head around what she's doing. But right. it is, I mean, it's like a miracle. I, it is. Those books are amazing. It, it, true. They are amazing. But that when you were first saying that, that was the first thing that came to mind was like, oh my god, yeah. that's her. Because the Thomases were like, oh my god. But then once you get it, yeah, and once you, you get like it. get it, you yes. get it. Yeah. Well, and I had the advantage she didn't, which is that I was making people up. Whereas if you write historical fiction, I mean, they all were named Thomas. <laughs> like, right. You, you couldn't, yeah. Them? And you could, and it, and it was, I like that she didn't put Thomas Cromwell every, and she right. didn't do, Mar you know what I mean? I no. appreciated that she didn't do that. She did. Know? And um, she's amazing. Those books are amazing. The other thing amazing. I kind of find fascinating too, though, is, um, and I don't know if you want to give this away or not, but, and you can tell me no, <laughs> but having triplets is completely unusual. So, yeah what sparked that? Yeah, well, I mean, it is unusual. And, um, and there are lots of things about this town that are unusual. And 
one of the things that I think everyone in this town is asking themselves is what of the aspects of their life, bad things and good things, are the result of this water and, and what is not? Um, and this is something that you never get to know. No, no one ever gets to know. Right. Um, and, and, that, and that was sort of the, the idea that I went into to it with. And, and that, that is an example. Um, it, was it because of the water that she became pregnant with triplets? Or right. was that going to happen anyway? Um, I too wanted to be able to look at a, at a as wide a spectrum of, of, of kids as I could. And, um, and so that that allowed me to do it like that these girls are so alike in so many ways and so completely completely different yeah and i think you brought up susan for the to talk about the cover at first but i don't know if we ever circled around to the cover did you guys ever circle oh. around to the cover i love the cover no. oh good and it, and, the, and and was the title was was there a lot of iterations did you have um was that the always the working title or did you that was not my working title, um, and it's my editor, who was amazing, picked picked came up with that title. Um, I have written four books and titled zero books, so at that point, I was not super surprised. <laughs> wasn't what? It wasn't your. That's not your strength. <laughs> uh, it is not apparently no, but she. I mean, I love it. She did a beautiful job, and they did an amazing job with this cover. I mean, in fact, I can take credit for nothing. Thing on the cover of this book. I didn't come up with the title. I didn't name myself. I, I did not come up with that cover, but they did a beautiful, beautiful job. Really good. Okay, and we have a couple comments beautiful. coming in. Okay. So yeah. Heather, um, she hasn't read one, two, three, but yet, but it's been on her shelf and it's on her book club book this month. So she will. Okay. But she wanted to say that she loved every one of your characters and this is how it always is. Oh. You did a fantastic job making, making each of those characters distinctive and she can't wait to read one, two, three. Thank you, Heather. Was, That's that a, was that a tough book to write the um, for you? This is how it always is? Well, it was much easier than this one. <laughs> um, you know, some books write easy and some books write hard. And uh, this this book was a pain in the ass, um, <laughs> which I think is appropriate because it's about teenagers, you know? Right. So it was like recalcitrant. Right. Um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, it, this was not an easy book to write. No. Um, I, I think in my mind, these two books go together um, because they are both about widening our idea of what normal is, yes. um, pushing those boundaries as, as wide as possible. Um, and so they go together, but this is how it always is, was a much simpler book um, for, I mean, in part, I think, because it is, it is all narrated. It's not like totally the same point of view, but it is quite a bit closer to coming out of my brain and, and that being, it's a third person. It's, it's not got a lot of distance. It's got a little bit of distance. Um, it's in a very comfortable literary past tense. This book is none of those things. That's what must make it interesting for you, though, as a writer, to not just do the same thing every time. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. You've got to have to challenge yourself to keep it interesting for you as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's true. And, and I also think that um, these aren't really decisions that I'm making. The, it, it seemed obvious to me that these girls were going to have to narrate in the first person because they're teenagers and that they were going to have to narrate in the present tense because they're teenagers. And the fact that I didn't know how to do that was, was my problem, not theirs. You know? like, I was the one who had to figure that out rather than them having to be flexible on that point. Well, uh, and teenagers are all about me anyway. Yes, so exactly. it's... <laughs> Yeah. So, so they like, couldn't be talked out of that. Yeah, so, exactly. That's, so a, that's an eye. eye. It it is a big eye. eye. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Karen Fowler is here. Hello, Karen. Oh, Karen. So she's got a great comment here. She's eavesdropping from her daughter's account. <laughs> so oh, she says, good. Oh, Karen. What I'm a so... wonderful conversation. So much brilliance. Lori, I remember you talking about this book how many years ago? And here it is, there's always an issue from a writer over how to deal with upsetting material while wanting readers to love reading. How did you think about doing that? Yeah, um, oh yes. Karen was there when I when I finished the, the first draft of, of this book, um, which is a really wonderful moment, frankly, when you, when you get to the end for the first time, even though it necessitates nothing but going back to the beginning the next day. Um, and in this case, it was my getting to the end for the first of like 
30 or 40 times uh, because because it, it requires so much rewriting. Um, there were there have been a gr this book has been fraught in all sorts of of ways that have had to be um, wrestled with and some of that happened in editing and some of it happened in um, sitting with it and and mm -hmm. realizing letting it master yeah letting it just like yeah yeah, yeah um sort of negotiating with yourself like what what can be cut um what can be compromised on when am i in like an authorial snit and insisting on something that is not a big deal and honestly can get changed versus when when am i right about this when when am i right that i need to insist on this thing even though it's hard and even if it's going to be upsetting to people um and even if you know i worry about sending it out into the world um which is which is always the problem is that yeah. you write this book and and it's in and it's in your head and it's in your heart and and you work on it and work on it and work on it and it it becomes it becomes as good a thing as you can make it but then it leaves your hands and um and it is a very it is a very frightening thing right I, because you can't control how people are you know what you wanted it to do yeah but how people are reacting to that is the complete unknown it um, is. And, and I, I think it's hard for novelists because we get to be pretty control freaky for a really long time. You know, like if I were writing a play and so I knew um, I was working with directors and producers and actors the whole time, but I'm not. This is this is all me. I, right. I control all of it for for years right. and then I control nothing. Right. And, and that shift is, is whiplashy for sure. Well, because and, and and I we hosted and then um, I'll let you let you both go. But one of the host, the authors that we hosted, um, Mosin Hammond, um, who wrote um, how to get rich, how to get oh I can't think of him right now. But he was talking about how in movies there's a, a focus puller, and in books we're or when you make a movie there's a focus yeah. puller that pulls in and out of focus, like you know focus on that car, or focus on this person. And in books, readers are the focus pullers and we decide who's important. So we're interpreting your work in what we think is important. So that's so out of your hands. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know, and it's just like, and we decide what we think is important versus what maybe you thought was not important. You know, it's, it's, yes. it's so fascinating. That's why I love doing this. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. It's boy, it's true. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, it definitely, it's a, it is an act of courage, I think. For sure. No question. Well, Susan, I'm going to um, ask you a question. So if you want to unmute yourself, you mentioned earlier that you have a new book coming out. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit about what that is and when that's coming or? <laughs> sure. Because it's, it's funny that we're talking about geography. Um, my book comes out in March um, from FSG and it's called Mecca and Mecca, California is a very particular place in the Coachella Valley. So actually my, my thinking much like Lori is it's all about these, these ideas of characters that you get. And, um, since Julie, we were talking about sort of the ocean and San Diego County, Orange County. Um, this book is, it's, a big California novel. Oh, so I never, cool. I always told, I told my agent, I never wanted to write the great American novel. I always wanted to write the great California novel. So um, Johnny Frias is a Mexican American uh, CHP officer. Um, so he rides a motorcycle and he's from Santa Ana Canyon and his people came to California in 1772. Wow. And he's dark skinned. So during these recent eras when people are like, you should go back to Mexico. Johnny Frias is fond of saying, I've never been there. Right. Um, and my mom came with the Anza expedition in 1772. So he's one main character. And another main character is um, Madalas, who actually lives in San Bernardino and Riverside area. And then part of it takes place on the Paula Reservation, which is near Oceanside. Mm -hmm. And part of it is in Mecca in the Coachella Valley. And part of it is in LA, in Los Feliz and in East Hollywood. Wow. So, yeah, it's it's all these characters and like Lori, that's why I love Lori's work so much. I'm really trying to like what does it mean to be in from a place that's so big, but how do you find your home, whether it's in Santa Ana or Coachella or Los Feliz, or what if 
there's a whole group of uh, a family with three brothers actually from Oaxaca and they've created an entire compound in East Hollywood. There's an apartment complex with 10 cottages and that's all family from Oaxaca. Wow. So I'm trying to decide how people how create home. So really Lori and I are always writing about the same kind of thing. How do you, how do you create home in, in a place that's big? And really what does it mean to be an American, right? Yep. Um, Karen is on here saying she's so excited, Susan. She's happy to hear about the new book. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. So Thanks, um, is there a website, Susan, that you have that you can direct people to that maybe can follow along with you until the book is out next year? Do you have a, is it if susanstraight.com or anything like that? Yeah, I think I published my first book 30 years ago, which is <laughs> funny. And I, I feel, and I just turned 60, so I feel like I'm bad at the website thing. But yeah, I've had a website for a long time. But also, I think for peop, for readers like me and Lori, one of the best things that I love about, about Lori and about doing bookstore things is how much we love to read. You know, like Karen's, Karen's books, Lori's book. I just, I can't wait to go back into a bookstore. It's going to be exciting. It's but yeah, it's easy to find me um, on at Susan Strait. And it's funny because really, Lori and I were talking before this event, Born, the, the place in her novel could be anywhere as we were talking about. So I just, I love the idea of like, what does it mean to, to, to think about community and memory and home? And um, one thing I was thinking about with with Lori's book is the same thing I was thinking about with mine is again, like, what does it mean to be a family? You know, what does it mean to not be able to leave your home during a pandemic versus your home is poisoned versus like the guy I was writing about in Mecca, you know, he grew up in this remote Canyon as a cattle rancher. And so when people are like, well, what's a cowboy? Well, vaqueros were the first cowboy. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so it yeah. was fun writing about somebody who was, whose, whose grandfather was a vaquero in a place like Chino. So right. yeah, I think I think it's nice to talk about home and geography. This has been super fun. It's been really fun. And Lori, I usually avoid asking this question, but usually people always want to know because I know the book is just released, but are you working on something else? I am, yes. <laughs> that was my last question too, Julie. Like I was like, what are you working on now? Yeah. I always am writing the next thing. Well, and also they wrested this thing out of my hands at some point. So then, you know, I've just been sitting around. So I have to, I have to, I have to be writing the next book um, really for my own health and sanity. So yeah, I'm uh, well, in fact, way too far into the next novel and it's just, it's a big fat mess. So it has to, it has to, I have to do this. I have to go back, back to the beginning again. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Cut like 50 or 75,000 words. Oh, and, uh, that's gotta be brutal. It, yeah, um, it's, yes, it is. It's brutal, but you know what? It's easier than than writing them the first time, it, yeah. cutting them, I think sometimes. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm writing the next, I'm writing the next novel. You oh, know right. what's funny, Lori? How hard is this one? The, the, the whole thing about the first draft is I, I treasure having had a friendship for all these 30 years with Joyce Carol Oates. And I met her 30 years ago and she spoke to this big audience at UCR where I teach. And I remember I was like 28 or 29 and I was so nervous about my first book coming out. And I was in the audience scared to introduce myself to her. But you know what she said, Lori? She stood up there and she said, this is what I want you to envision. And she said, you're swimming across the Hudson River. And I remember thinking like, I don't know how big the Hudson is, but it sounds big, right? You're swimming across the Hudson. And like a tree comes at you and then a rock and then some ice and you dodge all that and you make it all across the river and you pull yourself out onto the bank and you're gasping and you you're reaching and then someone on a bridge above goes eh that was the first draft now go back across and do it again but do it better <laughs> yeah. like, that's the first draft joyce carol Oates is like She's brilliant. That's exactly how yes. it feels, right, Lori? Yes, that is exactly how it feels. <laughs> That's exactly how it feels. <laughs> and Lori, for people who are watching for you, do you have a website you could direct people to find you like on your social media and stuff? I do. It's lauriefrankel.net. Perfect. And they can find like you're on Instagram or Twitter. On or Instagram like and Twitter and all of the things. Lori and I are on Instagram and we both, I think it's funny, we both are like, I don't know, here are some flowers. <laughs> <laughs> right? True. Right? Yeah. Well, this has been so fun. Lori, it was wonderful meeting you. Thank you. Congratulations on the book. Susan, wonderful meeting you as well. Can't wait for your next book. 
And so we're going to say good night to Facebook and um, thank you everybody for watching. Thank you. Julie. Thank you for having us. Thank Absolutely. you. And thank you all for being here.